the contribution this morning will be 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must be do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you. We thank you for so many blessings, that both spiritually and physically. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray now that as we give back to you, we do so with a giving heart, with our minds and our hearts in the correct places. Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. one need a cup <clears throat> okay to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper let's sing number six alas and did my Savior bleed okay let's sing alas and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he devote that sacred I'll be reading 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on that night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body for which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after, saying, after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, thank thee for the many blessings you bless us with. Be with us now as we take this bread, which represents the Son's body that we shed on the cross for our sins. Help us do so in a way acceptable and pleasing to thee. In Christ's name, amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, like mine, thank thee for everything you've done for us. Please be with us now as we partake of this cup that trips into our son's blood. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Pray with me, please. Most holy Heavenly Father, we come before thee this morning with joyful hearts, thanking thee for all the many wonderful blessings thou hast so richly blessed us with. Thank thee for the health that we enjoy. Thank thee that we have the assurance that thou will continue to watch over us and give us those blessings that we stand in need of. We help that pray that thou would help us always to be thankful for all those things you send our way for our good whether we realize it or not thank thee heavenly father that that we have been blessed with this congregation here that we may worship together we may serve thee together we pray that thou would continue to be harmonious most of all we pray that it will be according to thy will Pray that thou wilt be with all those who are striving to extend the borders of thy kingdom, to save those who are lost. Pray that thou wilt help their efforts and give them the knowledge and help them to do it according to thy will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Seven twenty one will be the invitation song. <clears throat> Mark that. Before Eddie's lesson, we'll sing 208. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Lena and I have different waters. His is underneath, mine's to the side here. So don't worry, I think we're drinking out to each other. Every once in a while you hear a sermon that sort of sticks with you. It's one that you can remember for, you might say, the rest of your life. Because it just had an impact on you. It was things that were said that, that you just remember. And sometimes that'll happen. I know uh, every year you give around 200 lessons. It may be Sunday school or preaching or whatever, around 200 of them there. And most of the time, I can't tell you what I preached last Sunday. A little more, go back a year or more or so. But about a year ago, about this time, I gave a lesson. And that lesson was remembered by several of you. Because as we got closer here to the this time of the year, there were some who said, I remember that lesson. Now, why don't you preach it again? And I thought about it. I said, well, you know, if it's worth preaching once, it's worth preaching twice. So that's what we're going to do this morning. And for some, you will recognize it. And for some, it may be for the first time that you've heard this. Maybe you weren't here a year ago. But we're going to talk this morning about the Star Spangled Banner and how it came about. Because most people, even though we've heard that song many times at sporting events, uh, maybe a fireworks display like they had one here last night in Vernon. It was, it was performed there. Many don't know the history behind how it came about with the Star Spangled Banner. Well, in 1931, it became our, our national anthem, official national anthem, 1931. It was first played at the World Series Game 1 in 1918 between the Chicago Cubs and the Boston Red Sox. And most of us know that the author of the Star, Star Spangled Banner was Francis Scott Key. He was a lawyer in Baltimore. He was also a poet. He would write different things, poetry and such as that. And he wrote many poems. And, and of course, he wrote the Star Spangled Banner. But it wasn't called that in the beginning. He called it the Defense of Fort McHenry the defense of Fort McHenry, and later it became known as the Star Spangled Banner. In 1812, you heard probably heard the War of 1812, you remember from history, what well, had been going on for some two years, and the colonies were at war with Britain, and both sides had taken prisoners. Uh, Americans had taken Brit prisoners, and Brit had taken American prisoners, and and the American prisoners were being held in a ship out in the, out in the bay there, or in the ocean or sea there. And of course, the Americans were held on land in a building of some sort. Well, there came this idea we need to do a prisoner swap, one for one. We'll see if we can work that out. And Francis Scott Key was the one that was delegated by the American government to go to this ship and work out a deal where they can swap these prisoners. So he goes, and he begins to talk with these individuals who were in charge there about this particular release, and they worked out a deal. And they said, we'll do one-on-one, -on -one. and we'll start it real soon. Maybe, didn't really say when, but it'd be real soon. So what Mr. Key did, he went down below the deck. That's where these prisoners, American prisoners were being held, and he told them the great news. There's gonna be a release. One-on-one, -on -one. you go and go back home, and the prisoners were happy to know that, and, and they were cheering and rejoicing that this deal had worked out. But when Mr. Key went back on deck, he met there with a British Admiral, Alexander Cochrane. He was there on deck, and, and he was talking about this prisoner exchange with him. And this Admiral said, well, it's really not going to be really not going to happen because we're going to release them anyway because very soon we're going to take a go to war here with Fort McHenry. And he said, if you look around you here, what's going on here, all these ships are here. And about 19 ships from Britain had come across and they had positioned themselves to attack Fort McHenry because that's where the, pretty much they thought the headquarters might be. Well, when, that, when he was told that, Mr. Mr. Key, he said, 
You don't want to do that because here in Fort McHenry, it's just mainly children and women. There are very few soldiers that are here. And that Christopher Admiral, he wouldn't take to it. We're going to do it anyway. But the only way is if they will surrender. If Fort McHenry will surrender, then we will not fire a shot. And we'll leave and we'll claim this as being our victory. Well, they had sent somebody to Fort McHenry, that Admiral did, to try to work out a deal to force surrender. And it didn't go through. And what the Admiral had told those people, or told those people by this messenger, he said, when you surrender, all you got to do is lower that flag and we'll know that you have surrendered and we won't fire a shot. But the news came back to him, to this Admiral, they were not going to surrender. And Mr. Key heard that and it greatly disturbed him that this was going to happen. So the war suddenly was about to take place. And sure enough, on September the 12th, 1814, around 6 a.m. that morning, that's when the first shot was fired from these ships. So you got 19 ships who are pounding this fort, trying to destroy it, trying to get them to lower that flag for surrender. But they would not. The sound was deafening. I mean, all these ships were firing at the same time, going off. And, and the prisoners below, they could hear this. And they would call out to Mr. Key, what's going on? And he would go down to them. He told them, for they're attacking Fort McHenry. And because of this, uh, they, the, the people on shore, they will not surrender. And they wanted to know often what was going on, how the war was going. And several times he would go down and report to the prisoners, the flag's still flying. The flag's still flying. And because of that, the uh, prisoners... They began to pray. And as they began to pray, they kept praying for the flag to remain, for the flag not to fall. Well, this battle continued on for 25 hours, shooting. But the last three hours, this admiral, he, he got questioning Mr. Key, and he said, why don't your people give up? I mean, here we are bombarding them over and over and over, but they will not give up. What's the problem with these people? And Mr. Key, he quoted George Washington as he talked to this admiral. He said, the thing that sets American Christians apart from all others is he will die on his feet before he dies on his knees. <clears throat> well, that made this admiral just that more angry. And he got sent word to all these 19 ships no longer are you to focus on Fort McHenry, but you focus on the flag itself. One way or the other, we're going to bring that flag down, and they will surrender. So for three hours, they fire, round after round, hitting that flag. And of course, there was smoke everywhere, and things were, it was a terrible situation to be in, I'm sure. He would go down, Mr. Key, and tell the prisoners what was happening. And their words were, as they, as they would pray, God, keep the flag flying. After three hours, they stopped the firing. And they looked when the smoke cleared. The flag was still there. How could it have survived this? And the admiral, he just gave up. We'll do it another day. He was tired of fighting. And he decided that we'll just quit and give up and we'll go ahead and have the prisoner exchange and all that went for. And when Mr. Key made his way back to the Fort McHenry, the first place he went to is where the flag was. How could that flag survive that? And he goes there and he realizes that this cost a lot of people's lives. And sure enough it did because that flag went down several times even in the first part of the battle, it went down, but people were running to it and holding it up, personally holding it up. And then in that final three hours when it was being bombarded, I mean, there, it was going down quite often, but somebody from the fort would run, maybe two or three of them, and they would hold that flag up. And in doing so, they were being killed as well. And Mr. Key said when he got there and that flag was still there, he looked around and there were hundreds of bodies 
of individuals, Americans there, that went to hold the flag up. And every time that a rocket would come in or a cannon would fire, it would kill many of them, but yet somebody would come in and they would take their place. And when seeing this, that brought about the writing of the, of the, of the great song as we know. And here's the original copy of it. You can't read it, but that's the original copy there. It's the Star Spangled Banner that Mr. Key wrote. And as he wrote that, he wrote it by looking at the things that were around him. How these individuals gave their life so the nation that we have today could be what it is. And of course, here's the flag, the original flag that was flown that particular day, who, who went through the onslaught of the battle. It was saved, and I'm sure it's on display, probably at the Smithsonian somewhere, it's on display, you see that. But that, he sees all this, and everything that's going on, him being a poet, he takes out pen and paper, and he begins to write. And as we have heard this song, many, many times, maybe when we know the history behind it, it helps us to better understand why he wrote it and what he saw when he did write it. Like he says, I'm not going to sing it. We're just going to read it. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight over the rapids we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave? Well, that's the story. Uh, how it got started in the Canadian history book. Most people just think, well, he saw something he wrote. He wrote this wrote out. But there were many individuals that gave their life when that flag failed to put it back up. And because of their efforts and efforts of many others, I'm sure over the years, we have the nation that we have. And it's not perfect. It's got a lot of flaws. And it seems that those flaws are getting greater and greater day in and day out. But still we have a great, we have a great nation as we're soon we'll celebrate here in a couple of days on the 4th of July. But we have a nation that was built on godly principles. And God says if we will do that, if we will build our nation, a nation on him, he will bless us. And he certainly has blessed us. As in Psalms 33 verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen at his own inheritance. If we put God first, he will bless us. And he has as a nation. In Proverbs 14, 34, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It's righteousness that makes a nation great, but sin will also destroy that nation as well. And we don't want that to happen. One thing that made Israel so popular was because they worshiped a true God. And God blessed Israel because of their worship of him, their service of him. And people would see that, and they wanted to go. They migrated to Israel, and they wanted to become a part of the Israeli, Israeli people. And many of them did. And Isaiah speaks of this in Isaiah 55 and verse 5. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know. And nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. God blessed Israel greater than, than any nation around them at that time because they were putting him first. And I think we can say the same thing about our nation. Our nation has been blessed greater than any nation that's ever existed on this earth. It's all because we, we glorify God. We give God the credit for what we have. And yet there's so many today who are trying to destroy that and tear it down. And, and we don't want that to happen. How terrible it would be for this nation to, to be destroyed. And, and it can. It can be. 
but yet we don't want this to happen. And we see evidence at our southern border of those individuals who are trying to get here by the thousands because of the blessings that God has given this nation. They're not going to other countries. They're not rushing there and trying to get in. They're rushing here to do so. But we've got to make sure, though, that we don't do what Israel eventually did and Judah did. And that is change our God. Instead of worshiping the one true God, we suddenly begin to worship ourselves. And there's trouble when that happens. And Jeremiah 2 and verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not, for, for what does not profit. That's what Israel did and Judah did. They changed gods. They gave up on the true God. They began pretty much worshiping self. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it. But Jeremiah 10, 23. Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks or direct his own steps. We just don't want people, we don't like people telling us what to do. But yet God says, here's what you are to do if you're going to receive my blessings, not only in this life, but in the next life to come. We need to follow the ways of God. God's ways are always right. It's Proverbs 19, 21. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. God's way is going to stand. Man's way will fall. Man's way will change. Laws will change eventually over time. But God's way will never change. And we need to understand that and follow God to the best of our ability and live a faithful life toward Him. No doubt our nation needs prayer. No doubt our nation needs change. And our nation needs to be healed. But our nation needs God more than anything else it needs. If it had God in the right place, many of these things would be taken care of if it just would do that. All we can do as individuals is live a righteous life, a godly life, pray for our nation, pray for others, and let God do the rest. Do the right thing by living the righteous life. And God will bless us. He certainly will bless us as he has blessed us here, every one of us here, tremendously as we are here today. So this morning, the Star Spangled Banner, yeah, it's sort of patriotic, you might, way of looking at it, but yet the Bible speaks about what God will do for those who will follow him, for those who will give him their, his way in their life, let him guide them. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, the Lord wants you to become that child of God. And I want you, he wants you to believe that his son Jesus is the son of God. He wants you to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. He wants you to confess his great name in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian did. He wants you to be baptized for forgiveness of your sins so he can wash away your sins so your name can be added in heaven so the Lord will add you to his church. All those great things can take place. And then one day receive that great blessing of heaven be our eternal home. This morning, if that need is there to become a Christian, do so, or as one who just needs to prayers, come back to our Lord to live a better life, a more righteous life for Him. We can work on that together and pray for one another for that to take place. If that need is there, please come as we stand and sing our invitation. When Jesus comes to reward His servant, let it be noon or night. Faithful to Him will He find us watching. With our lamps all trimmed and bright, oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? If at the dawn of the early morning he shall call us one, by one when to the Lord we restore our talents will he answer thee well done oh can we say we are ready brother ready for the soul bright home say will he find you and me still watching
watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come. Blessed are those whom the Lord finds watching, in his glory they shall share. If he shall come at the dawn or midnight, will he find us watching there? Oh, can we say we are ready? for the soul's bright home. Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall 